Good morning. Welcome to Riverline Presbyterian Church. We're delighted that you've joined us for worship this morning, either in person or virtually. And we hope you feel welcome, but most of all, we hope you feel the presence of the Lord. In the way of announcements, there's a few things I want to highlight. We have a mission fundraiser event for September the 17th. That is a yard sale. And uh, Barb and Jim Recknegger will be heading that up. If they need lots of help and you have a you have a sheet and a printout in your bulletin, so please look at it, and if you're willing to be able to help in that, contact Jim or Barb. And Sunday, August the 14th at 6 o'clock, we're bringing back the ice cream social, and there's a sign-up sheet in there. We need volunteers for that, and that's always a really good time, and we're happy to bring that back. And after the ice cream social, Bluegrass Harm will be providing music for us. And we would ask you that at the end of the service, if you would please remain in your pews until the end of the postlude. Does anyone else have an announcement? If not, then let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude. Before we say one thing I neglected, um, for those of you that don't know, Chris, our pastor Chris has COVID and he is, uh, he is home quarantining from that. So Steve Wilson will be bringing us the message this morning. So we're very thankful to have Steve Spacey with real short notice to be able to prepare a message for us today. But I spoke with Chris this morning and he felt pretty rough for three days, but he said he's feeling much better today. He's a lot less congested. So please continue to pray for Chris. Now let us stand and sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's hymn number 11 in your book, and the words will be printed on the screen.
Let us pray our prayer and confession. God, we are busy people. We need reminders. We need help remembering what is important. In this time of silent confession, we will try to slow down our thoughts and be present with you. Loving God, if something needs to be confessed, we will silently share it and then continue in silence. We will be still and be with our God. Now let us take a moment to silently confess our sins. God, silence is hard. Confession is hard. Faithful God, you stay with us through all the difficult parts of life. You have heard our confession and been with us in our silent prayers. For your faithfulness and love, we are grateful. Amen. Now, our good news is this. The steadfast love of God never ceases. God's mercies come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. That comes from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. And to continue in the good news, know that because of Jesus' redemptive grace, we all are forgiven. Amen. Now is the, now is the time for our anthem, and Brenda's going to be bringing it to us this morning. You may be seated. I'd like to share something first before I share this song. When I was in junior high school, um, now it's called middle school, but then it was junior high, my very first day there, I was assigned to a homeroom, and the teacher that was our homeroom teacher was Mr. Vincent. And everybody, every morning, would stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, he had a world map that they, he had pulled down over the blackboard. I never thought anything about it. After we finished the Pledge of Allegiance, he put the, black, he put the world map up, and there on the blackboard was a song. And it's the song that I'm about ready to share. And even then, at that time, I did not realize that God had his hand on me. Because he had, our homeroom teacher had us sing this song every morning, to the point that it took root in me. And the song is, He's Everything to Me.
Good morning, Presbyterians. I don't see any elementary school age children if they're out there and I'm missing anyone. It's time if you wish to go over for the children's time, you can leave and do so. Did you know that American Graffiti was on yesterday? <laughs> Anybody see that? It was on from 6 to 8 on our channel 511 which is the one that does the unedited movies, which sometimes is kind of eh, a little bit dicey. But American Graffiti was on. And I think at the very end is when they play all summer long by the Beach Boys. They're rolling and, and showing you what happened to those fictional characters in real life. And when I see that and think about it, it it's kind of like, they were really trying to size up what was important in their lives. It was a great summer, but they were thinking ahead, like, is this where I want to be? Is this what I'm supposed to do in life? And they make these different decisions that have a big effect on how things turn out. And this morning I was still thinking about that, so I went downstairs and I found my Endless Summer album there was a time when everybody had a copy of Endless Summer by the Beach Boys. So I played all summer long and it, it still kind of took me back to thinking about these things. This morning we'll look at Colossians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 11, and we start out and what we're getting is a feeling about how important God is and it's kind of giving us direction as we look at that. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with Him in glory. And then we continue on and we would get into what we might call some of the rules. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abuse of language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, but Christ is all and in all. I'm a numbers guy. For some reason, I've always enjoyed numbers. I think it's great that people have passions and things they can follow, playing a musical instrument, getting involved in some kind of a hobby or craft, building things. But I really don't have skills like that. I don't know if numbers is a skill. Sometimes I hope it isn't, but I know I just get along with them and I've always liked numbers. When I was small, one of the great things that I did was figure out how you could calculate a batting average of a baseball player. If he'd been up five times and got two hits, he was hitting 400. You take the two, divide it by five, but when you were that age, you're like, well, how do I do that? And you have to carry it out three or four places, and then you get the batting average. I thought that was so neat. We're all good with numbers. You're good with numbers too, whether it's a passion or you like it, but you understand what a paycheck is and what that signifies and what you can do with it. 
You understand numbers when we talk about inflation rates, when the prime rate goes up three quarters of a percent, you know what that's going to do and how it will affect you. If you remember when Becky Bresler was here, she came up with a figure when she first started to talk and she said there were 150 million people that did not know God, that did not want to do anything with God. They denied him. 150 million, and that was on the small side. It could have been as many as 200. And that number just bothers me so much as I think about it. The recent Gallup poll from this year said that 19% of the United States population does not believe in God. Now, if you take 332 million and 19% of that, that's 63 million in this country that do not believe. If you go to Mountaineer Field on a Saturday in September or October and there's 60,000 people there and you apply that percentage, you would have 11,400 people that do not believe in God. That just bothers me. It seems like it's too much. The truth is that there is a God. And we're okay with that because we're here. We understand it, that there's something special about each person, that they have these emotions that actually lead you to God things that you think about, things that you feel, things that you love. Wow, where does love come from? It's not something that evolved out of mud. It's something that is put within us and things that affect us. Last Sunday, Jamie talked about being an emotional guy, and I can relate to that. I think the older you get, the more emotional you get. Things that wouldn't bother you suddenly start to bother you. I hate to see cats and dogs that have been run over laying on the side of the road. I get kind of emotional about it. And I've gotten to where I even say a prayer, you know, God, please take care of that animal and give it a place in animal heaven where there's no traffic. It'll be okay. And, and we have emotions. You have emotions about people that you know, the things they're going through. And it's just something that it just can't evolve. It's put within us. And we have the Bible. That's something else that should lead us to God. And if you don't believe in that, then there are apologetical studies. There are things that will help you. And more likely than not, they will lead you to God. I get a kick now of thinking about the Garden of Eden, the way life was meant to be. I mean, can you imagine being Adam and Eve and you get to walk around in this beautiful garden? Animals, th there's no hostility. You could have probably walked up to a lion and scruffed him there on that mane and talked to him. It had to be really great walking with nature and having a companion there. And they got along, at least at first. I, mean, I, I see Adam saying, hey Eve, baby, I'm going out and play 18 today. <laughs> and she says, Adam, go play 36. It's okay. <laughs> no animosity. And the next day Adam says, what are you going to do? And she says, well, I want to go shopping today. And he says, I'll go with you. <laughs> They got along. <laughs> but then that old apple tree thing came up and changed it. Why do people not want to associate with God? Aren't they a little bit curious? What is life about? It's just hard to understand it, that there's no curiosity, no checking there. We've been Presbyterian for quite a while now, and I think I mentioned this to you before. In the larger catechism, the first question and answer just kind of blows me away. What is the chief and highest end of man? The chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully enjoy Him forever. 
But what's wrong with that? I hate it just, and that's great. And that's what we're supposed to do. Enjoy God. Enjoy the world. And I think back, that's how it started out. It was possible to really enjoy. I want to know what God has to say about this thing, about enjoying life. Mention the Bible. Why do people reject the Bible? There really are lots of good studies to help with that. Talks about the historical accuracy about it, the number of manuscripts that are written. There's nothing in ancient literature that comes close to being as accurate and well copied over the years as the Bible. So there's all sorts of things that people can do, and you don't have to be a, a brain scientist or an archaeologist to understand how accurate the Bible is. So we can say that God speaks, and he speaks to us through the Bible. We say that he exists, and we are sure of those things. So why are 150 million people not listening? Why do they not want to associate with God? Sometimes I think there is very poor understanding of what God wants from us. God wants us to love Him. That just doesn't seem like it's too much to ask when He's the one that created us. When I was a young fellow, I used to sit on the porch on the back step and we had concrete, a couple concrete steps. And I'd just sit there and I'd look down and these ants would be running all over the place. And I thought, oh, that's a pretty neat view, just to sit here and see how those ants interact and what they're up to. I think it's kind of like that sometimes with God, that he's looking at us to see how we're interacting. What are we up to? And what kind of respect do we pay to him? Further along in that Colossians reading, we read about actions which God does not approve of. Impurity, evil desire, Greed, malice, anger, lying. I think folks look at the church sometimes and think that we are demanding, that God is demanding that we keep these certain rules. These are things you must do. But you know, they're really getting ahead of themselves. Number one is to love God. You'll be able to figure out rules as you go along, but just love God. Some of those rules we'll read about seem pretty clear. Malice, lying, but everything starts with the love of God. I finished the book reading it, and a pastor had wrote it. He has a pretty large church, and it was about grace. He said, think about the grace that comes from God. And he said something that is really kind of edgy when you think about it. He said, forget about the rules. Just love God. If you love God, you will want to do the things that please God. And it won't be a struggle. You won't even see it as being rules to follow. Think about people that you care about, a spouse, a good friend, and you want to do things that will please them. Nobody's really asking you to. You may have a coffee group that you go out with, and maybe at 9 o'clock on Wednesdays you have coffee and you talk, and they're your friends. They're kind of like family. Well, you wouldn't go out and exercise in the morning and then work in the garden and look at your watch and say, oh, I got five minutes before the coffee group and then rush over to wherever it is you're having coffee and just go in there, dirty, stinking. They'd look at you and think, oh, you want to have a certain conduct. You, you want to please people. You want to be a part of that group, but you want to do things that do not offend them. And it can be like that with God. It's not so much hard, fast rules, but it's just love of God and wanting to please Him. Well, that's how it started out too. 
And what we found out that things got so kind of haywire in our actions that some rules had to be printed up. And they're in the Bible. The commandments, pretty straightforward, aren't they? Thou shalt not kill. I mean, I, I don't think I've actually, well, I'm pretty sure I never physically attacked someone with a gun or a knife and killed them. But you know, you also get into a, a fine point that sometimes we have to go back to God and look for answers. Thou shalt not kill. Well, I come from what is called a peace church, and we were brought up to be against war. And when we got to turning 18 and it was time to sign up, we had an option that we could register as COs, which was conscientious objector. And we would have some talk about it in groups. And it came time to make that decision. And I thought about it for a while. And it was a big deal at that time when you're 18 and you actually get to make a decision. And probably the only time I can ever recall hanging out my fleece, I actually got an answer. What I should do when it was time to sign up. And I was amazed at that, because I could say, usually I ask things and hang out my fleece, and it's just nothing really clear happens, but this was the one time that it clearly happened, and I still don't understand it. I don't even know if it makes a lot of sense, but it was there. And we have things like that, like killing. How do we handle it? Do we just completely say no, or is it something that we need to consider? And I'll tell you too, in our peace church, we had people that served in the military. And they would come in on the holidays, like Memorial Day, and be dressed. And they got a lot of respect. We left it up to individuals to work it out with God. Really fascinating. And there will be things like that that happen. And we look at rules, we look at situations around us, and we're not always sure that there's a hard, fast answer but it's left up to individuals to think it out seriously. And the careful part is you don't want to take your own desires and wishes and plug that in and then say, well, that's what God wants. Now, it's actually a debate, a conversation with God. How do I handle a certain situation or a rule that other people want me to follow? So much for rules, but what does God want us to do? We know the answer. The church knows the answer. He wants us to love one another. He wants us to help each other. I don't see anything sinister in that that makes me want to not be involved with God. It's okay to look after each other. And I think maybe that's part of that thing inside of us, our conscience or whatever that has somehow come about, that God has put in us. We want to help each other. Love God, read scripture, look and listen. Is there someone I know that could use assistance today or help? And it's often simple stuff. A text, a phone call, a card, a visit. Can I turn myself off for a half hour and think of someone else? I'm not a very gregarious person. Uh, large groups and I, I, I just sort of fade into the background. But as you get involved in groups, you will find people that are really special. They come into the room or come to see you and it's just like, wow, this person is great. And they talk with you and you feel better. They pick you up when you're feeling low. You just might be that person to someone else. By small actions, we try to follow the lead of God. There are many types of ministry. And we do have to ask ourselves, where do I fit in? Can I be of use to God? Sometimes it starts out on a pretty low scale. 
Again, we've got people that aren't involved in the church. We have people that come to the church and don't know what to expect, but they want to be there. And then we have people as they start to get involved in activities. And maybe they're having that discussion and they think, yeah, there's a place where I fit in, where I'm being called. And each person is different in that process. We're not all on that same kind of a scale at the same place. Some of us are still learning, we're still trying. Some people have done good things. Some people find ministries that are completely different from someone else's. Maybe just as important, but it's what God has said to you. And I think he says that, that just try it out. Just come to church. It's really not a burden, it is an adventure. And we sort of build things like a brick wall. Think of a brick wall or a rock wall, and it's done piece by piece, unit by unit. So you come and you talk to God and you think, ah, there's something that I kind of feel like I'm being called to do. And you're laying a brick. And you lay another brick. And it keeps growing until you've really built a strong fortress. I don't know today if we have the patience sometimes to build brick by brick. We kind of want it immediately. We want a people and a God that satisfies us right now and solves all of our problems. But it's going to be a while and it'll take a long wait. I mean, this thing with the church and people not involved in church has been going on forever. And those numbers actually show it getting worse people not believing in God. But God works small most of the time. We have to go slow and steady. In Kaiser, when I was growing up, we had a guy who was the master bricklayer in town. And he was called Speedy Van Meter. And Speedy could lay brick faster than anyone. And he, Mom actually used him one time for an old shed. It was a wooden shed and it was crumbling and had a hole in the roof. And she finally said, let's get rid of it. And Speedy and his gang came in and used those big concrete blocks, put one down, kept going. And it was a fast process, but I'll tell you, they went one brick at a time. We go one brick at a time as we try to find our place. And at the end of the day, we hope to say, it's another brick in the wall. Pink Floyd. <laughs> Perspective comes into it. Did you watch America's Got Talent this week and see the guy who did the PowerPoint comic act? It was really funny and clever. It only lasted about three minutes, but he had things on a PowerPoint. He would show that and then do a, a few comic sentences about it. The last one he did was about marriage. And he said, do you know 44% of marriages end in divorce? Went up on the screen. He said, my wife and I, before we got married, we talked about that. And I just said, is it really worth it? Comes up on the screen, 56% of marriages end in death. He said, you got two options if you get married. <laughs> You're gonna get divorced or die. <laughs> With a perspective like that. Ugh. But there's another perspective to it, and that's what do you get in marriage? As those years go by and you share these ex experiences with your mate, I mean, that's really special. What happens over those years? You go through the good, you go through the bad. Sometimes get your old photographs out. I was doing that and I thought, wow, I've, there's things I forgot about. And it all comes back to you when you see the photos. We have pictures on our honeymoon. And there's this really neat little glare in her eyes and happiness. 
Uh, we've been through that. We've been through the deaths of all parents, all four parents, a lot of tragedy in the family. But it's worth it. It's really been an amazing experience. So keep a perspective on it that shows you and keeps telling you just how great it is to be part of the church. Well, we still got 150 million people, 63 million people in this country, and there's 11,400 football fans in Morgantown <laughs> that do not believe in God. So how do we address that? And I think we've talked about this before. Every day, we just bring a game that says, God, is there something I can do today? Can you show me something that you want me to do that might help someone else? I don't think it's possible to just give a great speech to football fans in Morgantown, and they're all going to rush out and say, yeah, we've got it. We want God. But I think it starts on a small basis, one-to-one -one with the people that you come in contact with just by being a person that seeks God and, and tries to be the kind that's available to talk to. You don't want to go up to people and do that stuff of, hey, are you saved? That puts people off. But you can be a friend. And sooner or later, when people need someone, you may be the person that they seek out. But why are you the way you are? How do you stay calm when there's so much going on that is wrong in the world. And in your families, you've probably got a black sheep somewhere in your family. Just be the best person you can. Talk to them. Sooner or later, just about every person gets to where they start thinking about God and what's it all about. And maybe you can be there for them. It starts over each and every day. I really think we should get up and say, God, here I am. I'm vertical. Can I do something for you today? And listen, and you'll really be surprised that the opportunities that come up, and they won't be big deals, but they'll be important deals. There once was an endless summer for all of us. And those days were pretty special. But it's still summertime. And it's not like when we were young and hopping all over the place, riding around in our cars and seeing each other. But it's still important because it is an endless summer for someone else today. And there are people today that just need a friend, that just need someone to talk to. Today we do what God puts before us and tomorrow, we start and do it again. At this time, if our ushers will come up, we will have our tithes and offerings.
You can be seated. I believe that Emma Rose is back home. Unless that has changed, she is uh, working on getting rid of some pneumonia. But uh, the last thing that came out on the prayer chain was that she was home and a bit tired but recuperating. Was there anything further on Emma Rose? Do we have others that uh, need to be brought up? Mary's got the mic if you have a prayer concern. Okay, Emma Rose is home and improving. Yes. Great. Yes. No, she's through with the pneumonia. She's with the big alcohol. It's gone. The ammonia, pneumonia is gone. Okay, great. It went by. She'll be building her strength back up then. Yes. Fantastic. Steve. Whoa. I had a text just this morning from Joyce Ryan, and she is in the hospital with pneumonia. Oh, my God. And I don't know any more details. She just asked for prayers. So Joyce Ryan now has pneumonia. Randy? Just think, uh, I remember all the prayers from my mom. She uh, did her strength back. She's feeling better. She's got the home variety now. And Jackson General turned out to be a great place for her because in the 14 days there, she had over 30, 32 different visitors. So, and now it's a wonderful experience for her. Okay, Randy's mom is much better. Good. Much better. Joe? I would ask y'all to continue to pray for Jane and Joanne. Jane uh, has a MRI on her upper spine on Tuesday morning, and then she will have a virtual with her doctor in Cleveland on Friday morning. And we're just continuing to pray that we can find some answers and get her some relief. And Joanna is really struggling with her viral infection. She's had a really bad flare up of rheumatoid arthritis. She went to rheumatologists on Friday, Friday and they took several vials of fluid off of her knee. And she's still experiencing evening and night um, uh, fevers. And she's still still growing rough. But continue to pray for both of them, please. And we do thank you for the past prayer. Any other prayer concerns? Kevin in the back. I think we need to continue to pray for all the victims of the flooding in Kentucky. I'm just sure many people in the disability is devastating. And I, I can just imagine, I, well, I can't imagine, but we just need to keep praying for the people that they've lost in their families. I think that's it, Mary. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your presence with us today. We thank you for your presence, whether the times are good or the times are not good. We count on you to be there, and you always are. We thank you for the good news about Randy's mom and Emma Rose, that they are in the recuperation process and doing much better. We pray for Joyce that has pneumonia now, and we pray for Jane and Joanne. We pray for others that may not have been mentioned. We just ask that they know that you're with them and that things will work out, that you won't leave. 
We pray for the flooding victims. There's been some very serious flooding in Kentucky and elsewhere. Please help there to be people that will come to help out and try to get things back to working order. And thank you for those that have volunteered to help. We pray for our church. Help us to be faithful to you. Guide us in this week ahead. And we pray together as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, a reminder to please stay out of the aisle till our candles are taken care of by the acolytes and carried out into the world which is what that signifies. It's the light from here leaving and going out into the community. Let us sing together our last hymn. Please stand for blessed assurance. that there are refreshments in the gymnasium uh, right after the postlude. May God the Father be with you this week. May you be willing to serve him each day. May you be available for the opportunities and faithful to the call. Amen. Amen.